welcome to the tutorial for version 2 of Morpher. If you haven't seen the first tutorial video yet, then start with that because we only cover the new features. So the first feature we will cover is cache modes. This wasn't introduced in version 2, but it was created after the first tutorial video. So we type stat morpher, and we can see what the evaluation cost of these morphs are. If I turn on posture, you'll see that this cost goes up because I don't evaluate at zero. If I reset it, you'll see that it goes back down again. So I'm going to open the morph set. I'm going to find the posture morph. And of course we can do this directly on the morph itself. I'm going to change it to cache once. Compile. Now I'm going to directly set it to 1. And it does what we expect. But you'll see there hasn't been a significant cost. And it hasn't continued to evaluate. So even if I reset it now, nothing happens because it's already cached. And it caches the first time it's at a value that is not 0. So if you would like it to recache later for any reason at all, the morph itself, if we open it up fully, we can override can update conditional morph cache. So we could do this based on anything that we have available to us, anything that can happen during runtime. We can go get morph, morpher owner character, and we can see, well, maybe they've had some stuff change and we'd like to update. And if we want to use this function, then we need to change this to cache conditional. So if I change it here, and I just set this to true, it will be the same as not having any caching. So that covers the cache mode. Now the next feature to cover is the curve handler component, and this is new in version 2, and it's a huge quality of life update. So we've got this character, and it's in the demo content, that's morph demo character async curves. So in version 1, if you wanted to have a character update using curves, you would have an animation blueprint with a mod modified curve and a tmap with the names and the floats. And we still mostly do that, except instead we have added a component. So we go add, we just like morpher, and we choose morpher curve. We now get this component. And you have some options. We can check if the curve exists on the skeleton. And if it doesn't, it will tell us, because if it doesn't, then the modify curve node won't do anything, and it doesn't tell us. It just doesn't work. And you also have the option, which is disabled by default, to just add the curves if they're missing. So to get this to work, we do it pretty much the same way. We're just creating a UI here, so we have some sliders. This isn't even necessary. All you actually had to do was add the component and add the interface and make your morph set. All of the rest of the work is assigning the animation blueprint to your character mesh and then in the animation blueprint we're just going to grab the curve component so here it says if we don't have it cached then just cache it and if we do have it cached then just grab the morph map from this component and assign it and now we've got it set to the modify curve which we which comes before morpher and morpher is set to asynchronous and that's all it is the only thing is the way i'm getting the component using get component by class isn't available on initialize animation it may pay to cast directly to your blueprint, or if you've added it in C++ instead, you can cast to that and just grab it directly because it should be valid at that point. But if you're using a get component, you do kind of need to do this. So what this gives us is we've got the same tmap with an F name and a float value, but we have a callback now. So any time a morph value changes within that tmap, we have this event. So morph will always be null pointer. Because it's a curve, we don't have a reference, but we do have the index and the value. Now, if you just type morpher, you can see everything this can do. So we can actually bind directly to this as well. We can get the morph by the index, which that event gives us. We can get the index by the name. We can get the map itself. And of course, we can go set morpher value. We can give it a name. Or we could set it by the index. So it gives us similar functionality to a morph set when we're using synchronous updates. So another quality of life feature in version 2 are some editor tools you can use. So we can just come to Morpher Content, and you may have to enable Show Plugin Content. If you have it installed to the engine instead of to your project, you will also need to show engine content. And we can come to Editor and right-click Run Editor Utility Widget. So I've got it docked over here, but it will open like this. And once you have opened it once, you can go Tools. Editor Utility Widgets, and we just grab it there. So now if I take a morph, just any at random, 
going to open it. And I'm just going to set some values that um, are not helpful. So this has um, its update mode as curve. So we can change this here. If I set it to additive, you'll see that it changes. And I can make it auto set the curve name. So set it to waste size because they do need a valid curve name when you're using um, asynchronous updates. And of course, we can change the cache mode. So the reason this is useful is because if I take a morph set, such as this one here, and I want to change this for every single one. So if I set every one to additive, you'll see they've all changed. Every single one is now additive. And then I can set it back to value. And I can auto set every single curve name. And I can also change the cache mode. And of course, if I select individual morphs, I can do that to these uh, separately. If you select a morph set, then it will change the instanced ones. It won't, if I change this here to say curve, it will not change the corresponding morph to curve, only within this instance. So the most significant update in version two by far is the replication. We've got this character, it's called replicated character, but it won't have any replication with the way it's set up. If I just set number of players to, players client, and we've got a lot of latency being simulated as well. So if I change the head size, of course nothing happens. But now if I take this and I just type Morpher, I can choose Morpher Replicator. And we don't need to do anything, we can just compile and do that again. So now if we change the head size, it replicates. So what Morpher Replicator does is it just takes, it detects any change in Morph values, it sends them to the server, and the server replicates to all the simulated proxies. Except Morpha has byte compression and short compression and long compression. So if I come to a morph set here, float compression level is short and we also have long and byte or disabled. So it's disabled, it sends whole floats and they're very expensive but it'll be completely accurate. Whereas with a byte, it's very cheap, it's just a single intake and it's quite inaccurate but for a lot of use cases it's fine. Short is a good compromise because it's quite accurate, but it's also quite cheap. Whereas if you need very accurate, but still a, some compression, we have long, which is just an int32. Um, so when it sends it to the server, we have an option here. Auto send morphs to server. By default, it's unreliable. We can disable it, so it will not automatically send morphs. And if we do that, I'll just show you here. If I go play, it will just look like it's not working. And the reason is because we're not sending them to the server anymore. So what I can do is just add a delay. <clears throat> we'll say four seconds. We'll go print string. We'll just say RPC. Now we take the Morpher replicator. Just like Morpher. So we have a few options here. We've got um, get replicator. And we've got initialize. So we've got this set to auto initialize. So we don't need to do that. Let's just grab the replicator. Now we type Morpher again. And go send all morphs to server reliable. And you have a few other options you can go through. We've got only morphs pending reliable RPC, so it's got some caching going on. However, if something fails to send, it doesn't actually detect that. So if we want to be absolutely certain, we just send every single morph, then we can disable that. But we don't. We don't need that. So now after four seconds, it's going to send them all. So I'm just going to make the change now. And there we go. It sent it. So the intended use case is to auto-send unreliable. So if they're dragging some UI sliders and you want everyone to see the changes they're making in real time, that's how you do it. But once they're done using the slider, manually send a reliable RPC to ensure that the final value is sent to every client. So we have extremely efficient and even cheap replication of all of our morph values. It doesn't send anything unnecessary. It compresses it. And the replication uses a fast array. So it's delta replication, which is very efficient. There should be very low bandwidth cost and there should be very low CPU cost as well. If you change auto send morphs to server to reliable, that's a valid option, but only if you're not changing your values constantly. Because otherwise it's going to send tons of reliable RPCs. You could have unstable networking conditions as a result. Whereas with unreliable, it's fine to send a lot. You just have to understand that some of them will be dropped. So we've got send all morphs to server on initialize generally quite handy because we might have changed some values prior to initialization. 
And of course, we've got auto initialize on begin play. We can disable that and then we need to manually call initialize. So that's it for the Morpher replicator component. However, we have some other options. We can make a character or any actor really. Just type Morpher. So we've got Morpher replicated actor. We've got Morpher curve replicated actor. And we've got pawn and we've got character as well. So that doesn't use an actor component like this. And that can be important if you are sending a massive amount of information because every time a component replicates, it sends an additional five bytes, four bytes to identify which component it is and another byte for the footer. So if you want to avoid that cost and using actors is a way to go and there's information on the wiki how to achieve that. So the only other thing is if I went and I took async curves, I'll just duplicate that. So I've got the morpher curve component. I'm going to delete that. Now I can add morpher curve replicator. So this inherits the morpher curve component. So we don't need both. We have all that same functionality. We can bind to the event when we set the values and it takes care of the replication as well, even though we're using asynchronous curves. So in theory, most if not all use cases should be covered by this. So give the wiki a read and it should give you a very good direction to decide how your project replicates. And a lot of them won't need it, even when they're multiplayer projects. Right, thank you for watching.